Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back to Real Conversations, where it's my pleasure and privilege to have Dr. Gary Klein, who is a cognitive psychologist, but also an author of five books, uh, one of which I think is one of the best books I've read most recently. Uh, many of you have seen me cite the book. It's called Seeing What Others Don't, which obviously this year in macro markets, that would be a good thing to have done. Uh, and we have one of the authors of that. So Gary, thank you for taking the time. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, it's great to uh, have another mind on the, uh, on the show here who can basically walk us through what is in our own minds, which can be a little uh, messy sometimes. But uh, the book that we had um, highlighted for a long time was, as you, as you know, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Dan Kahneman. Uh, how, would you, uh, how would you compare and contrast your style, your thoughts, your work with a work like that? Okay, so uh, Kahneman's uh, book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, is just a, a marvelous book describing a career that resulted in a Nobel Prize. And uh, it's really the book, his book really falls into two parts. The first part is how he got to where he was, and, uh, and then the second part is it just sort of elaborates on, uh, on, 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 the, on the various models and the various uh, uh, frameworks that, that he developed. And so my book doesn't, uh, doesn't take quite that structure. It takes a, a somewhat different structure. The first part of my book is um, really focused on a specific question. Where do insights come from? Mm -hmm. And um, when I started investigating it, I found that people didn't have a very, very clear answer. I, I certainly didn't have any idea. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the first part is sort of describes my threshings around to try to make sense of it. And then the second part is about, um, you know, if, if, if we have some idea about where insights come from, why don't, we, why, don't, why don't we have more of them? And the, the, the big surprise that, that I had when I did my research is that organizations say that they want to have more insights, but they're really afraid of insights. Yeah. And I, I describe wh why they're afraid of them. And then the third part uh, is some ideas I have about how to boost insights. Yeah, there were so many good ideas at the end of the book, and I want to get to those. Uh, but, but first, I, I usually like to spend a little bit more time on the background, you know, how you came to this point. As I pointed out, this is uh, your fifth book, so this is obviously not your first rodeo. Um, but you know, if, if you t go back to maybe 1989, not to pick the, uh, and if this is the wrong date, let me know. But 1989, like, you were, you were, you were pretty, um, pretty well established at that point. You know, kind of establishing yourself as something I think that people hadn't really uh, considered before, which was the naturalistic, naturalistic decision-making movement in 1989. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Right. That's another point of difference between uh, Danny Kahneman and me. And, and I should mention that Danny is, 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 a, is a good friend of mine. And, and so uh, even though I point out a contrast, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's just for purposes of, of explaining uh, the difference in our approaches. Of course. Um, so f for me, um, naturalistic decision-making study, studies how people actually make decisions, not under control conditions, right. but in, in, in real settings. And, and the reason that's important is that I can, I can do a carefully controlled study of, of decision-making, uh, but in order to get it controlled like that, I have to use an artificial task so that, that, that people have never seen it before. So I, I, I have a, a control over experience, namely people have no experience other than what I give them. So you can, you can do that kind of research, but you're missing something important, which is experience. Mm -hmm. And so when I started studying decision-making, I, I, I didn't study it in a laboratory. I said, let me, talk to, let me find out and see what I can learn from people who do this for a living. So I started out with firefighters who have to make life and death decisions under extreme time pressure and uncertainty. And according to all the literature, they shouldn't be able to do it, and yet they did. And so um, by investigating them, by riding with them, sleeping over in fire stations, interviewing them, I found out how they were using their experience in order to, to make split-second decisions. Now that's, and, um, you know, that, that's a, that obviously is going to appeal to me for those, uh, for those that are watching that know me. My father was a, a firefighter of 38 years. And when I, when, I was, when I was telling him about your book, he was like, this guy's completely nailed it. It's nice, it's nice that somebody actually knows what's going on. <laughs> so, and as I kind of dug a little further back, I mean, in the, in the 1970s, correct me if I'm wrong, but you also spent time with fighter pilots. You know, you, you've, you've spent a lot of time 
um, at least trying to understand simulation or try to you know, disunderstand it and saying, hey, look, I actually I end up in a place where I'd rather go with experience and what's actually happening, happening as opposed to what people think should be happening? Right. So now you're pull, pulling me way back. So what <laughs> happened there is um, the Arab oil embargo in 1973 drove the price of fuel way up. And all of a sudden in the Air Force, you had all these pilots who were used to flying as much as they wanted in order to, to train. They couldn't anymore. So they were going to have to uh, develop some of their skills in simulators, which up to that point had been sort of an adjunct, not quite a toy, but not much more than that. And now they were going to have to develop their skills, a lot of their skills in simulators, which raised the question, what is the nature of expertise and how can we use simulators to develop it? So, yeah, I've been looking at expertise, I guess, from that time on, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating to watch and try to bridge this to where our audience is, obviously, in financial markets, because there are so many theories on how markets should work and how efficient markets should be. There's a lot of linearity and assumptions, uh, put another way. And what we've come to conclude is that nonlinearity wins the day, embracing uncertainty, uh, et cetera. So I, I wonder if that is one of the main lessons, that, uh, at least that I felt like I was listening as you were using non-financial market examples uh, in terms of how to think. Right, and that, that's, that's a problem with a lot of careful analyses that are plotting trends very, very, very precisely, is um, what do you do when, when, when the trend shifts, when all of a sudden you have uh, nonlinear effects, when, when all of a sudden you, you, know, you, you, you have a, a shift over from, from one condition to another, and, and, and people get, get surprised by that, and, and, and they don't know uh, how to spot the early signs, and they don't know how to react quickly when, once everything starts ratcheting around. Now, can you um, can give some examples of that? Because, you, again, you, at the beginning of your book, you spent a lot of time on where insights actually come from, and from what I could tell, there was a, the answer was the element of surprise. Is, is that correct? And is that, at least for us in the investment community, is that the main lesson that we should learn from if we're actually trying to obtain insights? Right. So I, I was trying to find one path that, that explained insight, and I couldn't. I found instead three different paths. And one of the pathways is um, when we trap ourselves with assumptions, okay. and all of a sudden we realize, wait a second, I don't, these assumptions aren't getting me anything. They're getting in my way. <laughs> so we, uh, we have people... Uh, dropping their assumptions. That's one of the paths. A uh, second path is people making connections between different uh, data points, and, and the whole is more than the sum of the parts, and realizing oh, something else is going on here, or there's an, a new opportunity that I haven't realized. And the third path is spotting an anomaly and seeing, you know, usually when there's an anomaly that uh, doesn't really fit our beliefs, we find ways to explain it away, and most of the time that makes sense, but if we do that, we're just holding on to our own beliefs. And uh, there are times when we need to take the anomaly seriously and start investigating uh, what would happen if this was really true and, and, and wasn't just an accident. But all of these come by surprise. Insights are unexpected. They change the way we understand thing, how things work and how we can get them to work better, and they come without warning. So what kind of advice would you give to, uh, I affectionately call them central planners of the, uh, of the market ecosystem or economic uh, gravity, they, 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 really come to, to, you know, they really come to work, I think, every day uh, with assumptions, linear assumptions, ideologies. They have all the things that you're saying, probably not the best things to roll with. Um, and then when they see anomalies, uh, they tend to just wave them off as being, uh, as the Federal Reserve would call them, transitory. Uh, what advice would you give them? Right, so um, they've got to stop doing that. <laughs> they've, got to be, they've, they've got to start paying attention. Now, some anomalies are just transients, and so they should be waved away. So I'm, I'm not saying go crazy with this, but they, they need to pay more attention to inconvenient data because it's too easy to just uh, try to hold on to beliefs because we're comfortable with those beliefs. So they need to stop doing that, and they need to cultivate an active, curious mindset about what's going on rather than just a heads down, I'm going to crunch the, 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 the numbers and I'm going to do my job and I'm, I'm going to get everything to work out smoothly. Too many times we see people who are focused on um, getting everything right, you know, not making any mistakes and re reducing errors, 
But, you know, you, you don't want to go home at, at night and say, I had a great day. I didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> that, that's not a productive career. You, you want to make discoveries. You want to make insights. Now, how do you, like, how do we bridge that, though? I mean, my dad, uh, with every firefighter he's ever trained or attempted to train, they actually start with they know nothing. Uh, whereas, like, in markets, specifically economic theory, those who have PhDs in linear economics, you know, they really start with I know everything. And then they enter financial markets and, and they realize they probably don't know anything at all. Like, is that the problem that you know, in financial markets we don't really start from a position of humility? Um, I don't know the, I don't know the, the, uh, the uh, analysts who work in financial markets the way you do, so um, it, it doesn't sound surprising. They, they may know their own field very well, but there's no such thing as a one field that's isolated from everything else. Mm -hmm. But nobody can know everything. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the main premises Kahneman has as well. I mean, it, it, it's, it's opening your mind to, to, to knowing nothing at all. Um, but one of these uh, charts that you have, or at least um, you showed it quite succinctly on, on page 120 of your book, uh, where you show no insight versus gained insight. And just to make this discussion a little more progressive from here, on the gained insight uh, side, you said, look, uh, people that have ex escaped the fixation of flawed beliefs, uh, they have experience, they have an active stance, they have playful reasoning. You know, can you have all of those without experience? Like, can you just start to be more knowledgeable than everybody else by starting from a better place? Or does this actually just take time? Uh, a bit of both. Certainly it takes time. Certainly it, it, it takes, uh, you know, just a a more patient build-up build of experience and maybe not so patient if you really work hard at it. But that's not going to be enough if it's not coupled with, with, with this active mindset, which is driven by curiosity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find a lot of people simply don't act in, 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 in very curious ways. They're, they, they want to do things mechanically. They want to follow the steps. They feel safe doing that. And um, anomalies and, and, and uh, unexpected events are just distractions, and, and they try to screen them off rather than wondering about them. Well, that really is the heart of, like, in, at least in, in macro markets and economic policy, people want to be promised certainty, Gary. So at the end of the day, uh, I guess they want people to be quite certain about the policies that they're laying out. Right, and that's a trap because uh, you know, given all the all, all the variables and the unknowns, that's that's one place that Kahneman and I totally agree is um, overconfidence is a trap. And in, in, you know, given the, the number of variables that you have to take into account, um, nobody can be certain. Now we've seen a like through Kahneman's work. I mean, a, another a fan of yours, Malcolm Gladwell, has opened people's eyes to the the amount of reps that you might need to gain experience or. Um, you know, the ability to have an insight. You know, when you kind of th think about the, the, the world's eyes opening from a, I guess, a behavioral perspective, uh, certainly in financial markets, I mean, we would have never talked about behavioral finance 15, 20 years ago when I was coming out of college. I mean, at this point, do you think that a big, super huge industry like financial markets uh, and economics is ready for that kind of shock value of redoing how they think? Certainly not everybody is going to be ready for that, and and so it's going to be some sort of a, an evolution. And I'll use a sports analogy. Uh, Thirty years ago, nobody would have expected that statistics were going to be used so heavily in sports such as baseball. Exactly. And uh, you know now um, they they become essential tools, and the managers who are uncomfortable with those uh, have you know just faded away and and, and been replaced. But if you go back to like 15, 20, 30 years ago, it was all about the general manager and the old boy network having uh, their perceived insights, I, I suppose. Right. And, and it, it was people making judgments. And, and sometimes, you know, uh, people argue, well, they should have used statistics. But in their defense, they were using statistics. They were just flawed statistics, such <laughs> as batting average, which didn't take walks into account or, or things like that. And so they were getting a misleading picture by using those. Yeah, in the investment space, we've, you know, from, from way back, we've always celebrated the home run hitter. Who can make the biggest, quote unquote, call? But there's very little focus on who can make, you know, the least amount of mistakes or hit the most uh, base hits or have the highest on base percentage. You know, on the mistakes front, that's another question I had, because that's really the second part of your book. You know, people really in this society, if you think of a place like where I came from, my dad was a firefighter, but I also, 
you know, somehow found my way into an Ivy League institution where it got more peculiar from there, I can assure you. <laughs> but, but, you know, people from where I was educated are unbelievably fearful, Gary, of being, um, of, of looking like they're wrong. I, I don't know how else to say that. How, how much of a problem do you think that is today? I think it's a huge problem, and it was actually what drove me to write, uh, to do the research that led to, to the book. Uh, I used a simple diagram. If you want to improve performance, you got to need to do two things. You need to cut down on mistakes, and you, but you also need to increase insights and right. discoveries. Most organizations only focus on reducing mistakes. That's all that, that uh, all the attention is about reducing mistakes, in part because because you know mistakes are bad, but in part because nobody wants to be blamed. If there's a bad outcome, I don't want people to say, "Here's where you you, you skipped a step." I want to follow every step perfectly. And so you have people in that kind of a mentality, which is not a mentality about about making discoveries. In fact, it gets in the in the in the way of making discoveries when you go overboard about trying to eliminate all kinds of mistakes. Yeah, I mean, in the investment business, obviously, and in the re independent research space, we're constantly looking for that next big idea. We we don't get paid unless we find a, a, an insight, so to speak. Um, but on this, I, I think I actually I'm on the page that you're referring to on page 207, uh, there's that equation at the, at the beginning of chapter 16 where you say performance improvements equals reducing errors and uncertainty and plus insights. The, the question I had about that is how do you, like, how do, you do both? I mean, because you're, you're effectively saying that there's too much of a focus on, uh, on reducing you know, mistakes, but at the same time you have to do that to obtain an insight. Right. Uh you have to do both because both are both are essential if you're going to have effective performance. My, the, um, what you're trying to do is make sure that there's a healthy balance. Right now, I think most organizations have an unhealthy fixation on reducing mistakes. Right. And you you look at like Six Sigma and the popularity of Six Sigma until people went back and looked at the data and found that the the corporations that went wholeheartedly into Six Sigma underperformed the stock market. Well, that that's a fantastic part of your book. That you know where you basically uh, showed the post-mortem analysis of uh, the Jack right. Welch world where, you know, what percentage was that again? Because I, I, I forget it, I'm not, it's not coming to the top of my mind, but you said at some, at some point post um, GE making it famous, there was a large percentage of companies that had tried it that actually became less productive and less innovative? I think it was about 40% of the Fortune 200 companies. Which is just an astronomical number when you think of what people are being taught at business school. Um, they're basically being, they're trying not to fail, but they're being taught precisely how to fail, I guess is what you would say. <laughs> Right, and so that's why I think organizations actually fear insights because insights are disruptive, right? And and they have the potential for mistake. And organizations want to, you know, make sure that they haven't made any mistake, and so they they think that they can have this button-down mentality of 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 just what are all the steps, follow the steps, and try to eliminate errors. And that, I mean, organiza I mean, insights are disorganizing, and so they, they go against organiza organizational uh, cultures. Well, I mean, having uh, something beyond a one-factor model tends to disrupt people's line of thinking, I guess. I mean, this alone, just trying to take, you're basically saying at a bare minimum, you should have a two-factor model with some, some balance. Um, you know, do you see this happening? You, you advise a lot of people. Um, you know, plenty of people are now aware of the behavioral factors embedded in their decision-making process. Do you see significant strides being made in any industry specifically, whether it be firefighting or, 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 you know, or not uh, that, that we could call to attention? Uh, I've seen a, a, a big change in the firefighting industry because the work I did with firefighters has gotten fairly wide dissemination. Right. And firefighters, you know, appreciate now they know where where their their their, their experience how their experience is, is informing their performance. So I think I've seen uh, big changes in, in 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 that community. I haven't seen it in the financial analysis community. I think it's still gripped by. Um, by a fear of mistakes. Do you think that um, technology can aid and abet this progress? You know, for example, if we just go back to where you said in professional sports, we have so much technology now actually being put on the body of athletes so that we can monitor and sense, you know, see, see from a sensor perspective what they're doing and when, adrenaline, et, et cetera. Do you, do you think that that technology helps get you to where you'd like to see people be? 
I think it can. I think technology can get in the way um, too easily. But I think technology has that potential. And I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. It used to take 10,000 hours to grow a chess grandmaster. Okay. And uh, about 10 years. Uh, that's not true anymore because uh, chess players have access to uh, computer uh, computer uh, chess games and and can play lots and lots of different kinds of games and 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 have have that available to them. You're seeing chess grandmasters being grown in less than ten years, sometimes as few as five years. They they, they can just build a body of experience that much more quickly. I've been uh, exploring a a method called the shadow box uh, method for, for giving people scenarios, having them make decisions, and then uh, comparing what their choices were and their reasons to, to the choices and reasons of experts. And we're seeing uh, pretty rapid changes in, in their skill level. So that's it for, for individual decision making? Right, yes. Now, uh, I guess maybe you know, just to wrap up, like if you were to um, take kind of a mid-size organization that's in financial markets, and they could do anything, like uh, they could do anything and they're using your advice, you know, and, and it would have nothing actually to do, Gary, with anything that they think that they know. So in other words, it has nothing to do with their models, has nothing to do with their intellect, has nothing to do with what some of them call their gut. Um, what would be like the, the, the principles that you would start an organization uh, with on a clean slate? Um, I, would, I would use methods to, um harvest their experiences and let them uh, replay their experiences afterwards so that they can learn um, from what, uh, what decisions they made. What, sometimes you make a good, a good decision, it comes out poorly. So what, was the, what were the reasons behind the decision? And in, in, in hindsight, what should they have been noticing that they weren't paying attention to? I think if you start doing those sorts of things, an organization can really boost its expertise. So you can really, you force introspection, you, you force post-analysis, you get people to really review their process. Right, and in some circles it's called becoming a reflective practitioner. You're doing, but you're also learning while you do it. I love that, reflective uh, practitioner. And I, and I loved uh, your book. So again, uh, for those of you who didn't uh, hear it the first time, seeing what others don't, that's definitely the goal of the game in our industry. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Gary Klein, for really helping me see a little bit better that I didn't know what I was seeing at all. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. You can follow uh, Gary Klein. Obviously, you can get his book, but you can also follow him on Twitter. His uh, Twitter handle, we're going to pop it up right here. It's spelled Kleinsight, like Klein Insight, uh, which he obviously provides. So thanks again. Thank you. Take care.